All right, um, let's call our meeting to order. Um, let's see, um, a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Nope. Uh, vote on the um, agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, full approval. All right. Uh, we can move to um, public comment. Anyone in the room here for public comment? Nope. Or family here? Okay. Family. All right. Mr. Golding, anyone online for public comment? Yes, Chair, I'll be promoting over Sharon Busher. It is uh, now your turn, too. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I, I feel, feel like, like a broken, broken record, record, but I did um, speak to this last month where um, you are dealing with the holiday parking um, and the request to have two hours of free parking on Fridays and Saturdays. And I had spoken about the need to really pay attention to our downtown and felt this was not adequate. I realize that this is an impact on your budget. Um, so on Monday, I spoke at the Board of Finance and uh, just a, addressed it with the mayor, just saying that I was hoping that he could help fund this so that there could be more free parking during the holiday season. I'm so concerned about businesses in general downtown, but certainly our, um, all of our commercial space and retail that is so important. Um, I don't wanna lose any more stores. I know each story is a little different um, and I know it's got to do with safety and security and, and COVID and everything else, but um, I'm trying to figure out how we can make, how we can remove obstacles so that people will come down and shop and so I'm just making that request, hoping that the department can work with the city to get the funding to expand what is proposed. So thank you so much. Um, anyone else for on the line? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. For the benefit of uh, other members of the public who did jo just join, we're in public comment. And if anyone wishes to speak, please use the raise your hand feature. If you're joining from Zoom. And so at this time, there is uh, no one in queue, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, let's close public forum then. Um, let's move to the consent agenda. Motion uh, to approve the consent agenda. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, great. Any discussion? Do you want to adjust the minutes? Yes. Yep. <laughs> no, it's a light one. <laughs> It's a light one. Okay. Um, all in favor of um, approving the consent, the very light consent agenda, say aye. 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 Great. Full approval. Thank you. All right. Um, next up, we have asset management. Yes. Come on up, Warren, please. We're excited. This is a continued uh, effort with the Commission's interest in metrics to lift up in the hood a little bit and understand some of our internal workflows as we look to manage and make sure we're meeting uh, the public service requests in, uh, in appropriate time through our service level agreements. And uh, Warren is here. Warren works for, uh, uh, excuse me, for INT, Information and Technologies, but uh, is located here at 645 Pine and uh, excited to have you here, Warren. Yes, thank you. Let me just get uh, Presentation shared. Looks like we're running. All right. Um, yeah. So it's shaped and said. My name is Warren Rich. I'm the asset manager and GIS coordinator with um, the INT department, but working closely with DPW on both asset management and um, GIS. Um, so yeah, I'll start just with a little bit of background on the asset management system. Um, ViewWorks was adopted as the asset management software um, back in 2021, uh, prior to me starting here, but um, it's been in the works for um, 
about two and a half years now um, being actually launched for just under two years. So the implementation and data compi compilation took about a year and um, it was actually launched into use in the winter of 2022. Um, I started in August of 22, so I kind of picked it up six or seven months after it actually got underway. Um, this is just a quick kind of suggested roadmap from our software vendor of where you know where you should be at certain um, time periods throughout your implementation of an asset management system. Um, we're still very much down here in this year one to two work efficiency focus and I'm um, starting to trend towards our year two to three asset reliability. Ultimately, it leads up into less focus on the software itself and more using the software as a tool within asset management as a whole, among other existing processes and tools that can be used for asset management. So um, you can kind of see how these blocks get smaller. Work management is what we're focused on now, understanding the work, what we're doing, how we're doing it, how much time, money, all those kind of things. And as you understand more of that, the maintenance management piece comes in a little bit better, preventative maintenance, less reactive maintenance, what you're doing, um, until really all that should just be running a lot smoother and you can focus on more longer term kind of projections and um, understanding the assets as a whole better, um, needs over time and um, budget forecasting, things like that, just having a better handle on, on everything altogether. Um, so yeah, again, like we said, right now, we are one to two. It's really focused on work efficiency and management. Um, I'll be talking about work orders and service requests shortly, showing some data points from that. And I just wanted to make sure we kind of knew what that language meant. Um, a service request is basically something either coming from internal within the city or from the public via C-Click Fix um, that here's an issue, we need somebody to look into it. Um, the work order itself can spawn from a service request. If it's a, a legitimate issue that needs attention, um, a work order is generated off of the service request and that's where the actual you know, work is tracked on what happened, who did it, how long did it take, how much time, how many people, kind of things like that. Um, so service requests are often linked to work orders, but that's not always the case. Some work orders are generated by themselves. Um, some service requests don't necessarily um, you know, require a work order as part of the request. Um, service request, again, coming internally or through C-Click Fix, it really depends on the group. Um, certain groups are 99% C-Click Fix, certain groups have a lot more kind of internal um, requests coming in. It just, it, it's based on the, um, the group and how they work. Um, yeah, and work orders can, again, generate from a service request or scheduled interval. We have a lot of kind of preventative maintenance scheduled tasks that generate on set intervals to make sure things are being attended to in the right schedule to ensure um, you know, the function of that asset is, is going smoothly. Um, yeah, and a really powerful piece of the work order is being able to tag a specific asset to the work. So not just understanding the work itself and how much time it took, but where in space or within a building or anything, what exactly was that piece um, or that asset that was worked on, how much work was done on it. You could start counting work orders, compiling data on what does it actually take to upkeep this particular asset. Um, so yeah, currently uh, Parks and DPW are the primary users of it. Um, we've had interest in other groups throughout the city, but we're really focusing on getting it running smoothly within these two groups first. Um, within DPW, it's water, streets, traffic, parking facilities, and tech services that are utilizing service requests and work orders. Um, yeah, and as of last week when I ran these numbers, DPW alone has closed 16,549 work orders. So it's uh, pretty impressive it just shows how much work goes on um, and getting it recorded you know a lot of the stuff you could probably take a guess and a stab at it but now that we're actually recording this information um, you know we can put some data points behind the work and a total of 3,889 service requests so you know there's a lot of information flowing in and out of this um, we're trapping lab tracking labor equipment and inventory costs as part of work orders that rolls up into total cost, what does it cost to take care of this particular asset or you know, this particular type of work. Um, streets and traffic are utilizing that, um, that uh, monetary number on the work orders for billing purposes as well. If they need to bill out, whether it be another group within the city or um, you know, an external, like a knockdown for a signal or something that needs to get billed out, by tracking all of that work as it's occurring, you can get a, a more accurate um, you know, estimate of a cost that needs to be billed from it. 
And another aspect that we're tracking through the service request and the work orders really is um, the service level agreement metrics on cyclic fix requests mostly because that's what we have actual specific numbers set to that we've agreed upon um, responding to these requests in a set amount of time. And so by tracking not only the service request when it was you know, responded to or closed, but the work order kind of piece of it too, we can get at a, a little more detail on you know, what actually occurred to satisfy that request. Um, yeah, and then just a quick kind of overview of where we want to take it next. Again, we're still in this, this kind of phase one and we want to get past that and not just have this be a work order system. It needs to become a holistic asset management system and it will and it takes time. But um, yeah, one of the things is just focusing on the assets themselves, starting to look into some of this data we have on existing work orders and um, picking out trends and themes with assets that we can start using for planning, budgeting purposes. Um, same as, yeah, the higher level asset analysis, condition, performance, maintenance, replacement needs. These are all really important things to understand to keep up with the, um, the assets and keep them running smoothly in the long term. And this is, you know, tracking all this data helps to get towards that. And then, yeah, kind of getting, getting the focus on the ViewWork system not just for the people who are inputting the data on a day-to-day -day basis, but trying to take some of that data out and get it in the hands of the key decision makers to start making decisions with and, you know, use some data-driven decision making like we're getting. And um, yeah, just keeping up with work orders and service requests, we can't let that go because that's where a lot of the really important data comes from. So making sure that continues to work, work smoothly. And then, yeah, it's taking ViewWorks as a piece of the whole asset management realm once it's really under control and we're getting solid data out of it, it becomes a tool and not necessarily the solution asset management itself, but um, it's, it's the starting point currently. Um, yeah, so I will go ahead and share some of these uh, data that we have currently for it. Um, I'll be focusing on streets, DPW maintenance, and, oh, we're still seeing, oh, let me, you might need to reshare. reshare, yeah, I was stuck on my other one. There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, Streets and traffic is what I'll be focusing on now, not because the other groups, you know, aren't, aren't using it, but I have a good handle on how they're using this, and I feel like they've, they've really kind of adopted it early and have better data up to this point. Um, you know, it's one of those things where the adoption takes time and just getting it to, you know, be used regularly and correctly, um, the data itself won't necessarily tell the whole picture when there's gaps in that. So. We decided streets and traffic would be a, um, you know, a good use case for this. So we can look at any range of time. I figured we'll just run a uh, kind of two and a half month period from September 1st to today. And then we start seeing some of the data in this first half coming out of work orders. Um, customer service, this is entirely a uh, recycling cart sale, but it does get into the bucket of streets maintenance and traffic um, the way the way that's set up. So that's interesting alone. It's really just kind of a record of the recycling cart sale. So there's not as much to kind of glean from that, but it is good that we're getting that recorded. Um, serial numbers and important aspects of the sale do get recorded with that. But once we dig kind of down into the, um, the streets themselves, you can see over here this list populates and these are all the activities types of work orders that have been conducted since September 1st um, and it's it's really just kind of a, a quick look and overview and sense of what's going on and what kind of work is occurring the most or more than others um, so sidewalk new sidewalk that rises to the top just with counts alone but also with labor hours um, you can tell there's really a lot of effort going into that um, yeah, and it goes all the way down, traffic calming, just one. And these are a kind of wide array of um, activity descriptions. Um, so some of them fit nicely into buckets, some of them don't. Um, some get kind of passed around. Um, and then down here, work order type. Um, this is whether it's a preventative maintenance, a reactive maintenance. These two key pieces are really key, and I think we'll start to glean some really interesting information. If we're at you know 80% reactive, 20% preventative, you know, we're not having time to upkeep with the assets and get them to the point where we're not being so reactive. You can actually have time to focus on the preventative side of things um, and get, get ahead of issues before they become issues. Um, the same way 
or up here, yeah. So this is the closed ones we were looking at. There's completed. This just means uh, supervisor manager needs to go in and review. We do have a QAQ process, QC process behind the work orders to make sure mm -hmm. the data is solid before it gets closed out, sent into the system, and we can take it as it is. <coughs> so moving on, uh, here are service requests. Um, and again, this, I see here 100% C-click fix coming in through maintenance. I mean, we could flip it over and just take a look at parking and tra or traffic, really. Um, very similar, um, these two groups. And a lot of DPW, from what I've seen, is more um, service requests being logged by C-click fix and not so much internal, just the way it works. Parks is kind of a different story, managing buildings and things like that, but um, DPW focus. Waste, water, and water, more, more preventative maintenance, building management, you know, infrastructure yep. management, less less kind of customer complaints about how our yes. wastewater plants are operating. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, it's a, you know, the same, same kind of deal here. You can click on it and see what the, the biggest issues were, um, service request wise, or, um, you know, C-click fix request, traffic signal problem rises to the top. Graffiti at times has risen to the top. Um, it's not as high with traffic currently. And, um, we're looking at an average of six days before a service request is closed. So that means from the time the C-click fix is logged by somebody from the public until it is actually commented on and closed in C-click fix. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the work wasn't completed sooner, but that's when it actually got back to the original requester that it was done. And um, yeah, just for continuity's sake, we can flip over and look the same thing with with streets and they have an even lower days. And we do have SLAs set to these different categories. So the, the average alone is not the whole story. Um, that's where we can go to next. Um, so what we're looking at here is the pie chart is the first thing to populate and we're 78.8% are being completed and closed out and notified to the original requester within the SLA that we agreed upon. Um, we do have this 20% that are not, and that's where you get into a little more details on what's actually going on, what the requests are that are going past SLA, um, total days overdue, average days overdue. Um, and if you click on a specific one, you can see, you know, I originally had just average, but it's good to see the maximum to see how that skew is coming with the average, and you can kind of dig down in. And a, a lot of this, it can be many reasons why these weren't met on time, majority of the time it's not because it wasn't done on time it either sat on somebody's desk after being completed and didn't get actually closed out to close the loop and finish the request um, sometimes these get routed if it's a kind of iffy we're not sure who it should go to it can get sent to another group or department before it makes its way but that original log date is still the same so there's you know, take it with a grain of salt what this is there's a, more digging that needs to be done to actually get down to tell the true story of why we're not meeting these SLAs. Um, but this is the data, this is what the person who originally submitted the C-click fix is going to see. They're going to you know, say whether it got done within the seven days or whether it took 14. Um, so it's, both sides are important. And one more part with traffic, they are really good at relating work orders to the service request, which means that we can pull out a little bit more data from it and actually find out when the work was completed and not just necessarily the service request itself closed out. Um, again, we have this QAQC process. We want the data to be solid before taking it, and that's an important step. It also puts um, you know, the effort on the supervisor foreman needs to get in and actually go through and close all these and do that work. Um, so interesting with traffic specifically, we're at 28% not met to when it was closed, but for these ones that are linked to work order, we're at 9.7% of the work being completed. So the work order itself says this was done at this date, it just didn't get reviewed and the loop entirely closed on until after the fact. Um, and that I think is a really powerful use of the work order to service request relation as well. We can have you know, a solid paper trail behind what actually happened. How did this issue get addressed and fixed? Um, and you can see the different steps, whether it was open and progress, completed to closed, kind of the whole, the whole lineage, and get more detail just 
solely based on open to close. Um, yeah, and same thing over here where we're looking at some of these. Um, but yeah, you know, the devil's in the details a little bit with some of these and it takes more digging. But this, this platform alone has been useful internally just for a quick kind of snapshot mm -hmm. of how are we doing, where are we overall, you know, what, what groups are doing really well using the system, you know, who maybe needs some more training, we need to revise how the work order form, are we capturing the data we want, all these kind of metrics. And one last just graph since September of last year, this is uh, the count of service requests past SLA. And there's some ups and downs, there's some spikes, but um, I really like here at the end, you can see in the past few months, um, you know, our efforts to improve the system and the workflows and training and just getting everybody on board and to recognize the importance of inputting this data because it's, you know, it's part of their, their everyday work. They have to be out there not just doing the work but recording it. And um, we're seeing a downtrend and it's getting, it's getting better over time as we focus in more on it. So I think that's all I have for now. Great, thank you very much. Of course. <coughs> all right. <clears throat> um, let's see. Let's start with Commissioner Hogan. I know this is in your wheelhouse. Any questions? Data nerd. Uh, I enjoy data. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Question, um, Director Spencer, you mentioned uh, service level agreements. Is there a place that if I want to see those? Where would I go to? Where would I go to find those? Right. Uh, we are happy to share those with you. Uh, those are uh, not on the website, to my knowledge, anywhere. But more than happy to share those with the commission for your review and see if you think that the service requests are in line with your expectations. Uh, so yes, those are not public, but those are things. I think this tool. For me at this point, we haven't moved into the full-blown asset management of having this dictate what is rising to the top for capital replacement, you know, which assets are failing more than others, but it is helping me make sure that you know, we have in our metrics that we, we want at least 70% of our work orders to be met on time. As we get the crews trained, it appears that we are doing that in most of our groups which is where, where I want to see continued progress. So i um, happy to share the SLAs with you for your uh, review. Thanks, I would just suggest they be give me linked from here to somewhere. Okay. On your website. Yep. Squinting in there and I can see the different categories. Some it's seven days yeah. and some it's three. Mm -hmm. and right. Yeah. Great. Great to communicate that. Yep. Um, what's the update process to get your, get your data from ViewWorks into here? I mean, it seems really, into the current, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we get um, the the ViewWorks database itself is hosted by ViewWorks, but we get a nightly copy of it. So that's current as of yesterday at I think it's even midnight or something, or well, I guess today. We're going to look at it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I have a script that goes in and hits that database. So we take their copy of the database, load it into our kind of database server, and I have a script that kicks that out into a, a GIS data set because that's a it's a GIS platform where I'm doing a lot of that, um, the charts on. Um, ViewWorks originally did not have a very robust uh, visual data visualization platform. They've gotten better. They've just implemented uh, Power BI into it. So we can uh, gonna have that more natively within ViewWorks, but when I was creating these, it wasn't available, and I found this platform to be you know, more well-suited for the interactive kind of data visualization um, sure. that we were going for. With yeah, that makes sense. So the ViewWorks folks, like you, you have an account, you can log in and see some things in their platform. Yes. But the ViewWorks people aren't touching our, like your ArcGIS no. server directly. No, no, that's all in You grab data from them. Yeah, I take the data out of the database, just some there. SQL kind of scripting, and then you know, push it into feature class. And um, it is spatial data as well. A lot of the data has, um, you know, that long geolocation to it. So, um, you know, by converting into a GIS data set, once we have more data, we start looking at hot spots of service requests or work orders and kind of, you know, looking at density analysis and take it a little bit yeah. further. Oh, that's great. Uh, now, when you say like, you're, you're tracking labor hours for some of this, does that include contract work? I'm picturing like sidewalks was a big one there. This is just your just in-house in -house sidewalk yep. work. We're starting to input more contract work into it just to keep everything in a singular location and be able to tag 
assets to it because it's just as important um, you know sidewalks how many sidewalks we've replaced versus how many contractors we still need to know that the sidewalk was replaced yeah and so keeping it all in the system um, so that's one thing I'm working with um, tech services a little bit more soon to try and get more of this contract work into the system um, just to have it all in one location rather than you know PDFs here files here view works data here yeah. um, try and consolidate it all Great, thank you. Work in uh, progress. Maybe useful to have a uh, like a default date range up yeah. there. I pulled it up in one browser, like thought it was busted. I didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. Tried a different browser, yeah. same view, and then right. I'm like, oh, I gotta okay. put some dates in before. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. That's a good see call. something other than a blank screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe set it for like a month to the prior or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's but good yeah. stuff. So thanks for the update. Let's yeah, really look of forward to uh, see where you all take it. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Mujana. I too also really, really like data. And I guess what I'm interested in is maybe the other visualization side, actually looking at the assets themselves. Yep. What data do we have about particular assets and how we can make that more available to the public? Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's maybe stick with sidewalks, for example. Mm -hmm. I think I don't know how regularly the city, right, DPW themselves actually assays the quality of the sidewalks, mm -hmm. but would it be possible to make that kind of data available to the public either through this view or the uh, stat BTV yeah. sort of, um, yeah, that's I guess, public-facing uh, side? It, they might be up there on the open data portal, data.productionbt.gov, that um, I've worked on kind of revamping recently and trying to get more GIS data into it. Um, so sidewalks, for instance, in ViewWorks are a GIS data set, whereas everything in this building is what's considered a, uh, a vertical asset. It, it, you can't put it on a map, you know, try and put all these lights on a 2D, and it's just not gonna work. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, we have all of that loaded into the system, the GIS data, anything that can be made public, um, it's part of my goal to get it up onto the open data site so it is available and ready to use um, with some of the more internal kind of vertical assets, if you will. Um, you know, we could share them, it'd be kind of tabular in nature. Mm -hmm. It's really just a database kind of functionality of how we track and report them. Um, but yeah. The open data side of things is some, you know, another kind of part I'm, I'm working on a lot and want to get as much as we can out there. Right, but at least on the city's end, you could do it where you're just searching for a particular asset, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for you guys, it is like one giant list, but yeah. then what kind of information might the city have regarding a particular sidewalk, say, in between two, two streets, really how much data do we have about each asset and mm -hmm. where, where is that kind of really that focus on right and that that is a, an area of work of progress for us we do a sidewalk assessment a citywide sidewalk assessment about every five years we've just recently completed one I, my knowledge is it's not integrated into ViewWorks yet well I'll double check you you may know better than I do we pull data out of ViewWorks to update that sidewalk inventory so when those sidewalk um, work orders are done. If the sidewalk asset itself is tagged, we can you know pull out a list for the past two months that then we can take in and use in this other application that has mm -hmm. been historically used. It's a little bit of an interesting situation with the asset management platform versus all these other platforms that we've used kind of along. And um, you know, works isn't necessarily the placement for all of these, but it's kind of making them all work and talk together so we're not having disparate data in different locations. We'll look to see if we can make that public over the winter. All right. Very exciting. Uh, I'm super excited to see where this all goes, and uh, the integration especially, I think, is, is going to be a really good direction. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Fox. Hi. Um, I didn't have too much on this. The I feel like the two questions that I generated, you answered in sort of other responses, but I'll, um, I guess, I'll comment on them anyway. It was just about, yeah, um, you know, getting at the preventative versus the reactive maintenance. Um, you talked about being able to map hot spots where, um, to see like which assets are costing us the most to maintain long term. Um, 
you know, I feel like that piece is important, but it sounds like we're not at that point with the system yet. So I was just curious about that, but you sort of answered that already. Yeah. And then the other part of the question was then how would that then be prioritized into the sort of how we decide which assets to then work on, which it sounds like we're not there yet. So those were the two questions that I had and yeah. sort of asked and answered. And but the grand goal, though, yeah. and kind of, you know, what we have our eyes set on for success mm -hmm. of the system is yeah. being able to answer those kind of questions. So. Okay. And it will never there are very few assets for which the data alone will mm -hmm. indicate the order. A lot will also have to do with other related capital projects that are happening mm -hmm. or uh, with sidewalks we look at level of use as you all know it's not mm -hmm. just how bad is it but how highly is it used and right. so this is one important data set that underlies the, <clears throat> the decision making but it's not the totality yeah. and that's Part of, I think, our reluctance is saying, here's the sidewalk condition across the city. Well, mine's the worst in the city. How come you haven't done it for 10 mm -hmm. years? So there's a little bit of a balancing act there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That was the only comment slash questions that I had. Great, thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Barr. Thank you. Um, mine are more comments than questions. I, I just have to say how exciting it is to see the data and all these metrics start to come to the surface because any kind of decisions that we make need to be done with good data. So the improvement of these things over the years uh, is just fascinating to me. Um, and I would look forward to maybe getting some links to be able to dig into it if, okay. if it is available for us to look into. Okay. So because uh, as, as we've, you kind of mentioned, why isn't my sidewalk being fixed? I, I hear that all the time in, in Ward 1. And I try to explain, well, there's other places that don't even have sidewalks. <laughs> and so that's why things are happening. But it'd be helpful to have the data uh -huh. to, to back it up as I talk to people. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Vice Chair Damian. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start off first with like a hypothetical. So if somebody submitted a C-click fix today and it was something that um, from there, staff decided there needed to be some more internal conversation and maybe it had to be brought to the Public Works Commission. Is that something that would be reflected as a sort of 30-day uh, time frame, length of time for that particular C-Click fix in ViewWorks? As is now, yes. Okay. Um, because C-Click fix, we really only get this open or close, uh, especially once it comes into ViewWorks. It's open or it's closed. There's not a lot of middle ground. Um, that's where commenting mm -hmm. can kind of come into place. You know, commenting on the C-Click fix um, or through ViewWorks to say, you know, we're looking into this. This needs more time. Um, Right now, though, it's a little bit harder to kind of pluck those out of the entire, you know, data set itself. So that's, you know, probably why you're seeing some of those 30-day past SLAs in there. It's hard to say without looking closer into it, but yeah. Okay. So we're really just displaying it as is right now from submitted request to when it was actually closed. And I guess what I'm getting at is I'd be really curious to see in either the GIS platform that you had or somewhere... Um, sort of those items that did end up at least at the commission's responsibility to, mm -hmm. to talk about so that's something we could look at and see what are things that maybe we can be proactive as a commission to um, get you know some yeah. sort of ordinance change or something to help maybe prevent that yeah. in the future um, that came up right um, and then my other question was sort of you know this clearly takes a lot of staff time both on your end on on the rest of the department's time um, I guess more generally how has the department uh, been supported to um, to take that extra step from doing you know whatever the day-to-day -day job is but also taking that time to input this in here and and manage that on a you know division um, level right we're we're really working program by program and I want to acknowledge that Megan Moyer our division director for water resources here was a, a early and strong champion for this effort so um, each division has its own kind of uh, open windows for time to work on this. Some divisions are very contractor heavy like street maintenance, so they're jamming in the summer and then winter have a little more time to kind of do trainings and learn. But um, it, it is, it, 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 we have all stretches right now. We have some folks who are heavy users and some who yet haven't really gotten into it. Uh, so uh, still work in progress. It's great to have Warren and in uh, water distribution, Rocky. Uh, who's just been promoted uh, was the asset manager over there so 
we've got a great team. It's going to take time, and we need the time and space. And unfortunately, one of the challenges of having a very ambitious administration with projects that we're not finding as much time to do the organizational building when we're doing the external building. So that's an inherent tension that we have with as much production as we're doing. Excellent. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Okay. I'm going to actually tag on to that. Um, because I think this human infrastructure piece is really important. So um, beyond kind of comfort with the system, what is the, like the training and onboarding for a new staff in the system, um, you know, while you're kind of running around repairing sidewalks and so forth? And, um, you know, is there, are there processes in place to onboard new folks with the expectation that they'll be engaged in the works yeah yeah I created a few training documents just kind of the ins and outs of work orders and service requests because most you know new people coming on are going to be at that level of you know inputting the data themselves so there's a couple videos they're all loaded up into NeoGov um, I think the training part, platform mm -hmm. yeah and um, I believe parks has started automatically assigning those to you know any people as part of onboarding which is something we you know should probably look into as well here and um, a lot of it is I I'm working close with individuals individual groups. Um, the, the system isn't one size fits all across mm -hmm. all the different departments, groups, whoever. It's really kind of tailored to a specific group. Um, so yeah, I kind of work closely with them and usually, you know, the foreman, supervisor, whoever it may be, I make sure they have a solid understanding or able to convey it to anybody they need to actually work with the system or, you know, just let them know, call me in, you know, when you need me, I'm readily available for you know training it, it doesn't take more than 30 or 45 minutes to kind of give somebody the overview um, but is there um, you know the kind of the repetitive nature where you need to work through it several times yes. right you can't just have that one yes. and done kind of thing and then of three three months it later falls. just like holy cow yeah. um, so I think you know baking that in as much as possible um, yep. may, may be able to help some with the comfort level yeah and just making it part of the the day-to-day -day process of their work and then it becomes, you know, again, you do it five times in a day and you're going to know a lot more than the first time you did right. it. So. <laughs> Co-workers can help out too. Yep, exactly. Um, is this tool at all, um, can it be predictive of labor needs um, during um, sort of like our seasonal, uh, it says it track, you, you were tracking, um, sorry, labor equipment um, and inventory as part of these work orders. Um, so moving into, say, you know, our construction season then um, having a sense that you know X number of feet of sidewalk or X type of project in the past has utilized this much labor at this much cost is this does it have the ability to be predictive in that level or yeah yeah, yeah. I mean just what I kind of what we saw with looking at new sidewalks that kind of work total labor hours for the past two months it kind of like represents that and if you could take that with expectation of how many employees you have you know how many hours you expect and we kind of things like that you can start to suss out a lot more of that information so yeah it's all aggregable data you can summarize it take it in use it with other kind of data sets um, to better understand the work yeah and the time that it takes and you know staffing needs things along those lines preventative versus reactive mm -hmm. um, if they're not getting the preventative too much reactive you know maybe we need some more help kind of things like that so that's one of the key things, particularly the work order aspect of the system is trying to get at. And then I guess um, also tied to that is, um, are you tracking any of the work orders that are based on either extreme weather impacts or excessive use, um, I imagine, some of the infrastructure around construction areas where the, the road isn't being, um, isn't under construction, but areas are and there's excessive you know heavy duty vehicles um, is there any way is that part of the tracking to um, identify the the rea the not the reactive um, but that oh this this um, this roadway Pine Street might need some additional paving because we've had you know lots of trucks on it or whatever something like that yeah less of the latter mm -hmm. currently of actually getting the you know the external contractor work kind of input into the system itself. Mm -hmm. um, for the storm kind of event or the, the extreme kind of event, um, particularly weather, that's something we've started to work on, um, creating its own kind of category, storm event. 
for streets if they need to you know go out and clear a bunch of catch patients because of a heavy heavy mm -hmm. you know deluge um, we're trying to capture that more I don't think we have it down perfectly just yet I'm trying to figure out where that fits best to be able to say show me you know all the work that occurred that occurred as part of this you know crazy storm we had last month or whatever mm -hmm. um, so that is something that we're working towards and we want to get you know in to track that better to be able to pull out that information rather than just you know looking by day and time when it right. worked, occurred, like say, hey, just show me all of the you know, crazy weather event work. So. Okay. I think you asked a really good question. You, you, the second to last question there about you, do we have enough labor? And fundamentally, this tool, when we get better with this tool, is intended in large part for me to be able to say this is with this level of funding here's the service level we can deliver to the community mm -hmm. there's a lot of concern on staff uh, in the staff level which is justified that we are building infrastructure that we do not have the resources to maintain and that is not a responsible place to be where you spend a lot of money on an asset if you don't give it the fair maintenance then it's going to deteriorate faster than it should and uh, you know there are examples main street great streets st paul street great streets we're adding to the fit and finish it requires a higher level of maintenance stormwater systems need to be maintained um, you know the trees uh, need to be maintained do we have that resource the level of cleaning uh, pervious pavers they need to be maintained so it is clear to us that we we are under resourced to do the proper level of o and m this tool should help us demonstrate how short we are and what we realistically need from a funding level to put into alignment the maintenance level and our staffing level to meet that need. Thank you. I think that's really important. Again, that human infrastructure piece um, is vital to maintaining the physical infrastructure. Yeah. Great. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay. That was really informative. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll close um, <coughs> number five. I'm sure there's no public comment or anything. Oh, oh that's oh, com public comment. Right. Sorry. Any any public in here to comment? No. Asset no. manager rocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole presentation could have been a lot shorter had we just boiled it down to that, Megan. <laughs> Mr. Golding, any um, public comment on the uh, on the line? Chair, there is no one with their hands up at this time, and so there's no one in queue. Okay, great. Then um, we will now close um, item number five. There's no action required. Okay. No. All right, on to lead and copper roll revisions. Team Water will be coming on up. I do want to introduce our new policy and programs Hi. advisor, Eleanor Walker. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, fun. They are going to talk to you about our attend school. Well, they will be successful. Our effort to fully comply with some EPA regulations that were passed recently, um, but that is going to involve engagement of every single person who has a service line in the city. So that's every single property uh, will needs to be paying attention to what we're proposing and why we're doing this and uh, be ready to help us so that we don't have to visit every single home. With that, I will pass it on to, I think it's working slowly but surely. Yeah, and just, uh, I'm, I'm Martin Lee, and here to support Eleanor. Um, Emily couldn't make it today, so Emily is our GIS specialist who's also been putting a lot of effort into this, and we have uh, um, a temp from UVM who's also on board helping out with this effort, so I'll let Eleanor uh, do the rest of the talking though, but I'm here to help answer questions. So uh, we're going to talk to you about this uh, water service line inventory project. I'm first going to start with a little bit of background about the lead and copper rule for those of you who may not be 
you know, breathing in every day. And then we'll talk a little bit about sort of um, our situation with the inventory and what needs to, to happen and our strategy to get it done. So the, um, the lead and copper rule has to do with lead exposure in drinking water. Um, so generally, you know, we've always, I mean, we've known for a long time now that uh, lead exposure in drinking water was bad, but there's sort of peak in national awareness of those health effects around the early 1980s. And the, the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is the, the federal law that um, regulates sort of clean drinking water, was amended in 1986 to ban the use of lead pipes in water systems. Mm -hmm. But it, that specific law did not retroactively require utilities to go back and remove lead from their infrastructure. And sort of as this national discourse continued, in 1991, the EPA established the lead and copper rule to protect public health and reduce exposure to lead and copper in drinking water. So this rule does two primary things. It establishes maximum contaminant levels for both lead and copper in drinking water. And then it requires water systems to implement treatment techniques if more than 10% of their samples are non-compliant. So what has Burlington been doing in terms of um, lead exposure prevention in drinking water? We've always sort of been ahead of the curve. So in 1982, when sort of a lot of this national discourse was happening, um, according to some the, our memos and records, we started conducting sampling uh, following sort of EPA procedures to assess lead, copper, iron, zinc, and cadmium levels in our water. And so what that study found um, is that six sites had elevated lead levels when immediately sampled at the tap. So I should mention in terms of sampling, you do three samples. You do one sort of immediately once the tap turns on, then you do one 30 seconds um, afterwards, and then one five minutes afterwards. So um, during so six sites had elevated lead levels when they immediately turned on the tap, but overall on average, they were not elevated. Um, and then that study also showed that Lake Champlain water, which is where we get our water from, is naturally soft, which means it's low in dissolved minerals and has general um, a neutral pH, which means that it's actually um, highly corrosive to indoor plumbing. So once it sort of reach, you know, reaches indoor plumbing, if it stands there a long time, then it can sort of start to leach um, some of those metals. Um, so following that study, uh, we started adding sodium hydroxide to prevent corrosion in 1984, and then we upgraded to using zinc orthophosphate in 1990 as sort of prevent uh, corrosion prevention. And currently, uh, we sample lead and, cover le lead and copper levels every three years in about 30 high priority locations. And so since uh, we've started doing this, this treatment, and since the rule has been in place, we've always been in compliance with all EPA maximum levels of lead and copper. Um, <coughs> but the reason we are here today is that in 2021, the EPA issued a revision to the lead and copper rule, and this is widely believed to be a sort of after the Flint, Michigan uh, water crisis when uh, drinking water quality was also again um, in the news. And so the goal of this rule revision is to better protect children and communities from lead exposure by removing all of the lead from the, the nation's drinking water systems. So as part of that revision, essentially to be in compliance, all local and state water utilities must develop and submit inventories of their service lines, identifying you know, all lead serv service lines that need to be replaced, as well as galvanized lines needing replacement, and we need to do this by October 16th, 2024. Um, so where we are generally, so in terms of old annual reports that we have, we have some from 1929 to 1937 that sort of list the kind of pipes that are in our system. And the reports from 1929 to 1937 uh, mention kinds of pipes as galvanized steel, cast iron, and lead. But then reports from 1939 onwards no longer mention lead as a potential pipe material. So we're not entirely sure if it means that all lead was removed from the system, but we can confidently say that at least from 1939 onwards, no lead has been installed um, in our system. And although we have no records or evidence of active lead service lines um, encountered in the field, we are still required 
to submit an inventory. So I was just gonna, I'm gonna pause on that. So like in my experience and the experience of Steve Roy, 35 years, there, nobody remembers like hitting a street and oh my gosh, there were all these lead service lines. So we can't say that there aren't any because there was this one blip in the annual reports which said that there were some installed, but anecdotally, I would believe that if there were many of these, we would have encountered one either in a repair or replacement to date. So part of this process, we'll run that to ground. And then obviously if we do encounter those, then something will be done at them, done for them. But even, even so with the corrosion control that we add, right, that has been coating the inside of that pipe. It's also been coating the inside of your older homes, which internally, separate from what the city can own and control, people could have lead pipes within their internal plumbing. And that is why another reason for adding corrosion control is to protect people from their own plumbing. So just, it, it is a scary topic, so I just want to be clear with what we know and what we don't know. And Are you reading this collective face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I also, because I had not ever heard of lead lines, and when, when Emily did the research and said, well, actually, the you know, Andy's annual reports mentioned it, I was like, huh? You know, uh, and then we just get, continue to talk through it. Um, it would be on a very limited, probably, number of streets, and we're trying to figure that out, so. Yeah. Deep breath. <laughs> mm, like mine. <laughs> um, but in terms of the sort of the inventory status and the, the, tra the strategy, so we have over 11,000 service accounts. That's both potable and non-potable lines. Of those, we have about 4,316 records of lines that like we have records for, we just need to review and confirm them. And that leaves us with 6,693 unknown lines that need to be identified. So we are ongoing doing you know, a really thorough records review. We have hired someone to help us uh, do that. So that's sort of the first uh, part of the strategy. And then we are gonna be relying a lot on the public, which is sort of why we're here today to have um, help them identify their own lines and answer a survey for us. And then we're also planning on doing, you know, in-person inspections or follow-up visits and also canvassing of neighborhoods. In terms of this, the timeline for this project, so here now in November, it's our initial outreach where we're informing the public of this requirement and sort of introducing data collection process, so finalizing the, the survey form that we're going to be using. And then from December to June, we're going to be contacting priority properties. So those are going to be properties with lines that are listed as unknown for us in these older neighborhoods that might be more likely uh, to have a lead line installed. Meanwhile, you know, we're hoping people answer the survey between December and June. So we're you know, gonna be compiling those responses, building that inventory, and sort of highlighting missing or non-compliant information. Then from June until September, we're gonna focus, focus our outreach on people that we have missing information from or that we need to you know, follow up from. Uh, the plan is to submit the inventory on time next October. And then we will be sharing with the public sort of the completed inventory in the shape of a map. Um, and then obviously, again, we don't plan on finding any lead lines, but if we do, then the second phase is to remove them. Um, so if that, ha you know, if we find lead lines, then we'll introduce the next phase of the project. To at, remove at no those cost lines. to the property, yes. there would be funding for that. Um, and then I, I just was gonna add, when we're talking about surveying customers and there's some materials that were in the packet, yeah. Like there's educational materials, we're potentially sending a magnet so that people could use that as the test. Yes. Um, we know people don't know what all different lines look like, so we want to collect the best information possible and not make mistakes. Yeah. So to, to build off of that, so, um, we're going to be using the ONTAP newsletter, which goes out in about one to two weeks. So that's going to be sort of the first time that the public hears about this project, and we're going to have all the information on the website, including the FAQs that was included in the packet. We're also planning on mailing postcard to um, every address in the city, which again was included, sort of a, a mock postcard was in the packet, along with a magnet, because that's a way that you can sort of um, help identify the material of the service line. Free magnet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Wow>. Then, 
In addition to the survey form, the last thing that was included in the packet was sort of a, a survey how-to, so how to identify, how to find your water service line and then identify the material. And then we, you know, as this is ongoing, we've, we have talked and partnered with other city programs, including Burlington Lead Program, because, you know, as people hear lead, they're going to Google and they're going to find Burlington Lead Program, so making sure that they are aware of what we're doing, aligning our messaging and sort of learning from what they know about talking to the public about about lead, and then the sort of fire marshal and code review are gonna, other programs that um, do inspections and go into people's homes, and so when they do that, they are willing to go and see uh, the, the service lines. And then we're also going to be partnering with large community organizations and landlords such as UVM to help reach more, more residents and make sure that people fill out the survey. And then the uh, Water Resources Division Customer Care Team is sort of already available for questions from the public. Um, and one other piece, because this might be a question you ask, is like, how are we going to do this? This is a lot of work. Uh, as we mentioned, we've already hired a temp. The state uh, did make planning loan money available. Um, and there is significant loan forgiveness for like, I think it's 100% for the first 100,000 and then 50% for every 100,000 after that. Um, and we were in a little bit of a holding pattern for a while because it, at first they were gonna have, make us hire a contractor and then do this work and we were trying to make the case like, it's our records, we're gonna be the best ones to contact people, we wanna do it internally and we've finally cleared that hurdle that yes, in fact, we can do it internally as long as the price per service line uh, of what it costs us to do that is, is less than $55 per connection. So uh, we'll be applying for that loan shortly to make sure that especially if we have to likely add another temporary person probably next summer to be getting into people's homes and be making sure that we can meet that deadline um, that we're pulling down as much funding from the state as possible uh, so that <coughs> rate payers are hold as, held as harmless as possible from this. That's it. Um, I'm happy also to, if you guys haven't seen them, to show some of the communication materials, that postcard and the, the from the packet, if that would be helpful. Okay, at this point, we want to hear from you. Yes. Um, thank you. This was um, this was great. <laughs> um, I'm sure, we have some questions here. Um, let's see, Commissioner Butano, you want to start? Uh, yeah. I guess just a quick question. <clears throat> so, 80s and 90s, it was the lead and copper rule. Are, is there any action required on copper pipes or any other uh, metals? No. Uh, so there is a galvanized requir requiring replacement. Um, and maybe I'll point it over to Martin to <laughs> give sure. that definition. Uh, um, yeah, so if, if there's a galvanized line, which we have a lot of in the city, that um, is determined to be at any point in time having been downstream of a known lead pipe. So it's like you have the water main in the street and then say you had, we find out that there was 20 feet of lead pipe and then a galvanized pipe to someone's house. That galvanized pipe would be considered galvanized needing replacement because the, the thought is that some of the lead might be stuck in the, the galvanized pipe because those pipes kind of tuberculate and they collect minerals is the is you know what they're saying and, and that's why they require that to be removed plus we like we want to get rid of galvanized pipes we do that whenever we can on our projects there is one caveat just again out of transparency so uh, that lead section so many galvanized pipes do have a short leaded section called the gooseneck that's the bendable part that allows it to connect to the main that EPA has determined that that short section is not sufficient to cause the problems that they're trying to um, deal with, with like um, you know a long section of galvanized after a legit like long section of lead. Um, the other thing is we, you know, as I said, there's many fixtures that have small amounts of lead. Older water meters have small amounts of lead, um, and these are all reasons why. As much as we don't like adding more chemicals to the water, we do add more chemicals, and in particular zinc orthophosphate, it has phosphorus in it. So that is a challenging one for me to be adding because then we're having to remove phosphorus on the wastewater side, but it is a very important thing to, from a public health perspective, to be protecting people from anything that might be in our plumbing system or your internal plumbing system. 
Absolutely. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Awesome work. Great. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Fox. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess I have a clarifying question about the actual process of inventorying one's water service line material. So is the magnet just to identify it if it's a lead pipe? Yeah, so it's sort of a, a multi-step process. So the first step would be to look at the color okay. of the line. So if it's plastic, it's either going to be blue, black, or white. Right. So sort of straight off the bat, you see that it's one of those colors. You're, you're, set, you're good to go. Copper, copper color is also pretty distinctive. But then if it's galvanized or if it's lead, um, both of those are going to be sort of silver grayish. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the magnet comes into play because the magnet will not stick to a lead line. Okay, got it. I guess I was just trying to discern like what, you know, obviously the end goal is to <coughs> identify the service line itself. Yeah. Um, so I guess I was just trying to like clarify that. So thank you. Um, and then I guess a couple of questions on um, the outreach. Um, so I think that the materials look really good. I'm wondering if they're gonna, are, that, are there plans for th that and the FAQs to be translated into yes. other, other languages as well? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. We also have a translation service, so it's newer to call our office. We have a, a number we can call and then it matches somebody so that our customer care agents could have translations and be able to talk to somebody on the phone. Okay, very cool. Um, okay. And so that is also part of the requirement of the rule is to make sure that you know you translate the material and you make an, an effort to reach everyone so that everyone knows about the the project. Great. Um, and then the last part of it is like you said, this is sort of daunting trying to get thousands of homeowners to voluntarily participate in a survey um, so do, you know like are there any specific like tactics you're taking to try to incentivize members of the public to help with this project like I think you are very good at conveying why it's important and why you're doing it and stuff but I mm -hmm. that's not gonna be enough for to get some people to take 10 minutes of their time to do something like this you know so I guess like yeah, what, what are their thoughts around incentivizing the public to participate, are there? Not even the free magnets. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why, you know, I think as we move further down, we're going to sort of maybe add in the urgency or do more canvassing. Mm -hmm. But also I think um, we are allowed to have unknowns in the okay. inventory. Okay. Um, at the end, we won't be non-compliant if we have unknowns. It's just um, then wish Emily was here, but then the requirement becomes you have to let the people know who have an unknown line know that their line is unknown. Okay. Um, and you have to sort of periodically try and find out what it is. But you are allowed to have unknowns in your inventory. Okay. Got it. And there will be, <clears throat> there's likely going to be uh, some of our inventory, like if you were to look at it, the, the household side, we're going to be able to figure out what the piece of material is from the curb to the house. Mm -hmm. We're not, unless we start potholing. We, we can presume that if it's copper from the, the curb stop to the house, that it's probably copper, but it may not be. And so mm -hmm. there's going to probably be a whole host of unknowns within the street and how we deal with those. Um, you know, I've been in conversations with the state and frankly also how to leverage money to potentially get galvanized lines replacement yeah. uh, because we could dig up an unknown and if it's galvanized, like they said, basically there's a way to kind of get some of those funded uh, with this money <coughs> potentially. So it's it's not going to be a perfect process. I suspect this is the first step of a long time, but it's a first step in getting a better inventory of what people have out there, and particularly the galvanized lines. That's going to be really helpful when we go to paving streets because we've already been asking people to self-identify so that we can proactively replace those because those are the most likely to leak the most likely to percolate the clogging that happens and then sometimes people experience low water pressure because even though they have a one inch service they only have this much effective uh, diameter because there's so much stuff in the pipe so 
it's all heading in the good direction. Okay. That's all I had. Thanks. Commissioner Barr. Oh, thank you. I want to also comment that I, I noticed that your timeline was a bunch of pipes with fittings. So how cool was that? Um, <laughs> I didn't want that just to be missed. <laughs> now that it's recorded, it's part of um, and And this is very daunting, and I live in a, a an over 200 year old house and I'm sure my my partner's gonna wonder why I've got my headlamp on it. I'm down there tonight cling. yeah <laughs> tonight, right? do, do refrigerator refrigerator magnets work no so oh that's why we're gonna be mailing a magnet because those sort of the thin ones <laughs> I don't, don't have a stick. thick enough magnet oh, I just I, just think that, like the poor postal office is gonna be like, <laughs> all stuck together. we might not, we might not be <laughs> Uh, you could you could drive down like in an ice cream truck and yeah. give them away. Yeah. And, and you can do a scratch test, um, but um, talking with the Burlington Light Program folks, we decided <laughs> on the not. magnet because just didn't want to get into scratching, my, scratching yeah. of potential lead. So. Yes. A very similar thing. We did have a lot of asbestos in my house. The, the entire furnace, I called it the octopus, was all asbestos. So we had to have that removed thirty something years ago. So. I'm, I hope I don't find any lead <laughs> or galvanize. Yeah. And you know, if anybody did find lead, then we would replace it at no cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're, we're you know we're hoping that people won't be afraid to like find lead because of then. Well, I'd rather find it and yeah. fix it yeah. than to yeah. not find it. So uh, no questions, just a lot of comments and done. Worried. I won't sleep. We should right. give an award for like the first person who just self. Uh, I almost did it before. I almost oh. did it before I coming here. <laughs> but I have a sick kid, so I didn't. <laughs> um, all right, um, Commissioner Hogan. But sometimes you can give rewards for like, the, you know, the, the even numbers, like the ten thousand or the oh, there you twenty thousand or whatever. Or maybe like the first commissioner who goes home to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's me tonight. I'll record it. I am gonna record it. Uh, question on that, like the timing of the. Postcards and thank you for including the, the draft in the in the packet there. But that um, one of them says on the postcard it says help us by uh, April one, I believe. When is that intended to go out? I guess my question was, if I uh, is that like a now thing or like December thing? Soon, I would say December or January at the at the mm -hmm. latest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, I guess what I was thinking is that there's a if I get a postcard that tells me to do something, but in the next like mm -hmm. five months, um, <laughs> no, I wouldn't because I'm sure. I'm dialed on this one. And I'm going to do it. But <laughs> <laughs> you're going to try to beat me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come back to every commission meeting, and then. <laughs> so I was curious, curious about the sort of the, the tiered mm -hmm. thing here. Is there an intent to um, send later rounds of mailers to the subset that you yes. know you haven't heard from yet? Yeah. With maybe Absolutely. more urgency around the the dates. Yeah, we sort of decided to not really be that urgent right now. You know, keep sort of keep that in our back pocket mm -hmm. um, as time goes on to try and force the issue a little bit. I mean, it would be interesting. Your idea is like I think we have occasionally done you know gift cards to Burlington like, local. You know, like if you do this by this date, then you get yeah. injured in some sort of. Um, it's a little hard because like the more desperate we get at the end, like you don't want to create that environment where somebody's like, I'm going to wait until the prize is better. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, have a variety of prizes. Like but I mean, how do you feel about, you know, it would be potentially public dollars going towards some set of incentives like that so that... For public health? Yeah. Public yeah. dollars for public yeah. health? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just making sure yeah. perception. You have my support. Okay. Yeah, and I think like, uh, see, there's help. needs to be a marketing board <laughs> piece to go along with the communications piece of this. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Uh, on the flyer, the page left of that dying, identifying your water service line material. Um, one part that, that struck me is, I think, makes sense, but struck me as a little confusing, and, and maybe others might find it confusing as well. Is I understand the the distinction of the like outside the house picture. There's a distinction between city responsibility and owner responsibility. That's all still like well outside the house. And then you know you're asking for a picture that's that's inside. Yes. Um, and I I'm trouble getting my head around that that relationship. Right? If, if a picture inside 
it seems to be like well within the domain of, of the property owner's responsibility. How do you, do you know, I mean, how, would, how does that help you know what's in the city service line? If you're taking a picture would, of it, I think my basement. it should be by the, the meter. So I think, I don't know if that's um, specifically think, mentioned, yeah. but people, I mean, I would expect we're gonna see the meter in these yeah. photos and then we know that one side is the city and one side is the private side. I think that, so that picture comes from, we, we can clarify, that that designation of responsibility is really around when we do a line replacement, other than lead, uh, that the section from the curb stop to the house is 100% the cost of the homeowner, mm -hmm. whereas the piece between the curb stop and the water main is a 50-50 cost share for our ordinance. So, but for this, we may either want to I don't know, we'll have to think about we whether could, we yeah. need that or just because it will make things a little confusing for this particular situation. If the water, if the water service line is lead, is that the city's responsibility? Even though it's like... The whole thing, yes. Downstream it's, of the picture, it's, it's, it's inside the curve. It, so interestingly, we are regulated all the way to the tap. That's why we take samples at the tap and not like disconnect the water service and take the sample there, which would frankly be a little easier because we can't control what people have in their, their plumbing. Um, but anything up to the meter, basically nobody should ever be touching that without our approval and authority. That particular schematic is really just about in other situations, the financial yeah. responsibility. But mm -hmm. for this, yeah. we can think about how to. Yeah, I think we, we, we yeah. you know try to sort of stuff as much information in that yeah. graphic as possible before this purpose might, might be clear. I'm yeah. seeing a different that. message between yeah, like the, the outside yeah. view and the inside. Yeah. 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 yeah, it seemed extraneous, I think. Yeah. Right, right, right. Panic inducing, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I get where you're coming from, but. Okay. okay. And is there any sense encouraging people to? Like, will the magnet help them tell if their own, really their responsibility, like their fixtures mm -hmm. and things are lead? Is there any sense of a... Uh, Not their fixtures, but I suppose if they actually had legit, like, lead like pipe. Yeah. Public health outreach from inside the, yeah. the meters. I mean, like something like stainless steel, that's not magnetic, right? So if someone took the mag magnet and went up to their faucet, it would be kind of useless mm -hmm. information. So I guess saying that this is just for that specific, is that what you're getting at? Like well, so if there's, um, I, I understand that the, the EPA requirement is for you to check mm -hmm. the service lines. Seems like there's a potentially in it. I don't know the likelihood of this, but if there's lead pipe inside the house, past your service lines, that's, you know, outside the purview of this EPA yeah, requirement, right. is there a like? You can do some research. A, you can do some a nod research. To yeah. Actually, give people like, oh, by the way, or like, if you're interested in checking it, your. They would. The they might have lead own, solder. I don't know, if, but I don't know if it would stick to. I don't. I, I don't think the magnet test is going to be appropriate unless somebody legit has a lead pipe like on the other side of their meter. Like, so say they test the service line and and it's lead, and then they start testing the pipes down downstream of the meter on the maybe on the pipe part you'd be able to do the, de the determination, but I do think that we can and should add some FAQs about what people can do to evaluate. And we do, and in some of the FAQs, um, we, um, the sort of the state of Vermont has sort of testing that um, you can do, so we link to that as well as to some of Burlington Lead Program's resources to try and get a consultation from them if lead is a worry. And also, I think if people are concerned about lead, then we have some like certain like preventative measures, such as like flushing the water um, if it hasn't been used in and six not, hours. Not drinking um, warm water from your tap, like that. And it's, I think there's a whole chunk of us generationally that if we weren't around and didn't have kids like the 1980s and 90s when some of this information was shared, that you shouldn't be filling your um, baby bottles formula with warm tap water because if you possibly had lead in your house that could be because that can cause leaching of the pipes mm -hmm. so um, again because of the testing we do I don't think that there is a large concern um, but I do know in the state we can make this available uh, the state had done a whole series of testing on schools and child care facilities and there was some data there from fixtures and once they replaced the fixtures then 
the test came back clean. So again, it can be an issue, uh, particularly for things that are not used for a long time, like the back, the back faucet or the back um, water bubbler at a school. If it never gets used and then somebody goes to use it and doesn't flush it, right? That's that's an elevated risk if there is lead present in the mm -hmm. pictures. And I just there's not as much information out there, I think nowadays about that. And also because we're a community that hasn't has benefited from the fact that we didn't put these things everywhere from a lead, lead line perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it would be appropriate to put it in the yeah. FAQ or something about like it. By the way, if you're interested in the stuff that you, your pictures, your stuff inside, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we don't need to know it for this requirement, but here's some helpful right. tips yeah. or. Is the mailing going to property owners and occupants for rentals? It's going to um, occupants because they are we are required to let them know that they you know could be exposed to lead. Again, very unlikely here, but mm -hmm. sort of as part of this rule is we do need to let sure. them know. So, does it also go to the property owner in those cases? Well, it's going to go to every address in Burlington. So I'm. Hoping that the property we may have to do we may have yeah. to do a um, that's a good point an occupant to kind of double up because we yeah. have the list of all the accounts and there are some ones where the property owner is not the occupant mm -hmm. but to the extent that we also want to let the occupant know and have them be advocating for their property manager to get into the right. basement right and to do this we yeah. may need to kind of go double listed on that yeah have to think about how so we can cross reference there's that. a good I see a good chunk of our properties are, are rented. Yeah. Yeah. Some chunk of those that uh, English is not the first language spoken there exactly. in this postcard. Mm -hmm. We'll get chunked, but if the property owner knows that maybe it's like, oh, the next time I, if I need to be in for maintenance or like next month or something, I know no, that's that a good point. It needs to happen from the property regardless, and it might not necessarily be the mm -hmm. tenant's responsibility. Hopefully, the tenant's responsibility. Okay. Uh, I like the pipe up messaging on there as well. It's good it's stuff. That's a wild design. <laughs> <laughs> All these hidden things. Uh, nothing further here. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Vice Chair Damiani. Um, I think most of my questions were answered. I think going back to the postcard, um, something, I think in color, to sort of really emphasize to your point that like if somebody might just throw it out, that like there's a lot of blue that makes sense it's water but something red or okay. something that's like red it needs to alert alert yeah alert alarm something hey read this don't throw it out um, so something yeah. to that effect I think would be helpful um, for the general public it's that like how do you make people feel urgent but not not yeah, that urgent yeah exactly. yeah we we're trying to walk that line no that totally makes sense I get that um, scaring people but not yeah really yeah hopefully once they see something that alerts them they'll yeah. be like okay it's probably okay. It's like the director's ed films you used to have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. Um, what's the other question? Oh, uh, on the, yeah, I think really emphasizing for that property management piece of really getting, making sure that the emphasis is not on the renters to try and, or the onus isn't on the renters to try and get their property manager in whatever way we can to get property owners to do that for their tenants, I think. Um, should be made and then finally for the magnet are the magnets already in stock I'm just curious if like the department has already ordered those I have a second follow-up question but we have not already ordered those but I'd be curious if <laughs> if there's an opportunity to sort of just market DPW so when I'm done with the magnet I could put it up on my fridge and just as a reminder to be like hey I can call DPW for XYZ thing just some other opportunity because I definitely will probably Put it on my fridge afterwards. Too. We we are considering that. Um, considered putting a phone number or something, anything yeah. or a water drop. Um, yeah. Right now we're considering um, having a round magnet that mm -hmm. we know the diameter of because part of the inventory, more like optional questions are like what's the diameter of the pipe and whatnot. So we were thinking that if we get mm -hmm. the picture with the magnet and we know the diameter of the magnet, then we can like have a good guess about the diameter of the pipe, but. Yeah, I'm putting like DPW logo or something. Cool. Definitely. Yeah, just something. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, That's it for me. That's it. All right. That's great. Um, 
Yeah, I'm just gonna underscore, underscore, underscore about the the, the renters and um, non-native English speakers, also folks who have limit, limited literacy either in English or their um, home language. So what, um, what kind of outreach to our community partners, what kind of funding those community partners need to do that kind of engagement on that level, whether it's AALB, CBOEO, what have you, um, school districts, cultural liaisons, um, feeling like those are really vulnerable populations and that postcard may not even, may not even get to the, to the families um, to, to be read. So who then is ultimately going to have their feet held to the fire? We need to inform um, the residents, um, but is informing saying, okay, well, we sent that in there. We have no idea what language they spoke, but we sent that in there, that we clicked that box. Um, so that kind of engagement with our community partners and then holding the um, landlords responsible for ultimately um, ensuring that um, mm -hmm. And I think that that balance, um, as someone who has a kid at the Burlington High School, you know, the PCBs and now lead, um, and I had lead tested in my other house in Burlington, um, the, the balance between this is, this is important um, without being kind of overly panicking because you will get folks on both ends mm -hmm. who are ticked off um, saying like who's gonna pay for this that's the first thing that someone commented on like I already paid enough in taxes someone messed up and I'm gonna pay more mm -hmm. without having the clear information of what's gonna be covered and I think that um, that that's finding your service line and those the city and owner responsibility, property owner responsibility, maybe my first read was, oh my God, we just had our street dug up with the um, relining the mm -hmm. water pipes. And then now I'm gonna have to pay for this, but we have four reading on. So making sure those, um, those messages are kind of clear moving on and maybe um, kind of removing those different responsibility pieces before you. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, we can make it clear that yeah. if there's a lead line, it will be replaced at no cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And also that, that was a right up front before yeah. I started. Yep, yeah. no, that makes sense. It and from just from the dollars. from the school <laughs> standpoint, we haven't really talked about it, but there's a, a portion of this rule revision that does apply to schools um, that requires a sort of um, regular testing of schools. But the state of Vermont sort of already has a program that exceeds those requirements so that's why we didn't really talk about it because we won't need to do anything there we'll still have the service. we might still have to get the inventory of what their line is on yes. the way to that um, yeah but but as far as outreach to community members the schools um, yeah. have um, some connections to cultural liaisons yes um, I can tell you it and yeah. those if you're not aware of those um, yeah but to your point yes allocating some funding so that if ALLV or whatever wants to have somebody who is working on this and getting the message out, how we can facilitate that. Right. Yeah. Um, and then those, so I just feel like, oh, well, there's, you know, only 6,693 lines that are, <laughs> that are unknown. Um, and you talked about that you don't need a full compliance rate. What percentage, um, after you do all the outreach, is there a target percentage under which you can have non-compliant, where you've been done all the outreach but you don't have the data points? Um, I'd have to get back to you on that. I, um, I do know that when we, we talked about sort of worst case scenario, if like nobody answers the survey, um, and we were, we were generally fine uh, in terms of compliance, even if they're all unknown. So I, we can double check to see if there's- Sorry, not, not being in violation of- yeah. The, of the regulatory requirement. We can, as long as we made every effort, we wouldn't be in violation, but then we would just be in this continuous cycle of trying to run those to ground. So it's definitely to everybody's advantage if we're like uh, 
mounting up to try to get this done and potentially hiring other people like it is to the ratepayers benefit that people comply within this window and that we don't turn this into a decades or mini, mini year, you know. <laughs> and ultimately it's for people's protection right mm -hmm. yeah. we give you this information and unfortunately maybe you are the one person who has a lead line and you don't check this like that is something people need to realize they do have personal responsibility for so I'm even thinking mm. of like PSAs. I'm just going to go video myself um, at home in the basement with my magnet. <laughs> um, but the visual, uh, uh, you know, a visual piece as well. I mean, your your QR code and your postcard is great, but is there again thinking about? Um, we are thinking of um, filming a video of how you would do it because it it can be confusing. I've looking to purchase a house right now. So I've been down to a lot of basements recently. And <laughs> with this project, I'm like, where is the service line? Um, and it is hard to find, and oftentimes. If you just so. had your um, water line worked on yeah. next to the city of Burlington, <laughs> you know where it is. Yes. Um, but so we will are planning on uh, doing a, a video that shows where it is and what it looks like. And um, I've actually someone doing the test and putting that on the website. Great. You can check out your meter at the same time. Yeah. So, <laughs> Whole great night planned for your benefit. <laughs> Bring your whole family down. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go check out the water. Um, that's all. No, thank you. Thank you very much for um, bringing this to our attention. Um, any any public in here for comments? Okay. Mr. Golding, anyone on the line? There is no one in queue at this time. Uh, Mr. Golding, anyone on the line for a public comment? Can you all hear me? Yep. yep. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, I, uh, I, I said, said there's, there's no one in queue at this, this time, time, so no one's, one's got, got their hand raised. raised. Okay, thank you very much. All right, great. Um, thank you very much. We will close item number six. Thanks. You're going to plan on coming back here every month. Well, you're welcome to stay. Thank you. Did you want to do my presentation too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I love your penny. That was an old one. Thing. I know. It's like you too. Yeah. I'm going to retire off that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, we really appreciate uh, your patience with three meaty topics. Uh, this one uh, we should go through fairly quickly. Um, staff has been monitoring our financial performance of our various special revenue funds, which are funded by, uh, by meters and by stays in the garages and lots. Uh, these sources fund a whole host of activities that we operate from school crossing guards to striping our streets to putting signs up and uh, so we need to manage and monitor how our funds are going that the, the three items I suggested there with the striping school crossing guards is the traffic fund uh, which is paid for by meters on the other side with the uh, garages as Jackie will say uh, is funding our garage operations and our lot operations and the maintenance and upkeep of those facilities. Uh, we are not trending as strongly as we'd like, as Jackie will say, so it's important for us to course correct mid-year. And uh, this is a start of a conversation. This is not uh, queued up for action, but we wanted to give you an insight of things we are looking at before we start talking to the downtown stakeholders. We'll be doing robust outreach, uh, as Jackie will talk, say in a second. So we're certainly not, uh, we don't have anything baked at this point, but want to get your initial insight before we start the outreach. And uh, I would just want to say, uh, Jackie Esperti has just been promoted into the position of division director for parking and traffic, uh, replacing mm -hmm. Jeff Paget. We're really excited to uh, have her in this position. And uh, take it away, Jackie. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so this is just going to be a kind of overlook of the funds and, and some ideas that we have. Um, so just as an overview, the, the 265 Parking Facilities Fund um, includes the two municipal garages, Marketplace and Downtown, and then the six uh, lots that are listed there. 
our budget for fiscal year 24 was 3.4 million dollars um, and just the staff kind of overview with Matt kind of running the show down there um, so as as a background um, prior to COVID this fund had about a 2.5 million dollar balance and as of right now we're about 3.25 million dollars in debt which is two debt instruments that we're carrying um, due to some capital funding uh, sorry some capital improvement projects that we've completed over the last five years or so um, the initial proposals that we're going to present to you are, are, are our way of kind of looking to pay off the debt and reverse the negative uh, income that we're that we're looking at for the years um, just two things to note that the rates in the garages most of the rates have not changed since July of 2014 and um, we are controlling our expenses as much as possible one of the big expenditures we have is security we went from 90 to about two hundred eighty thousand dollars for fiscal year 24 um, these slides you've seen before in one of Jeff's presentations so these are just some of the changes that were made um, improved lighting brighter paint colors um, change the marketplace from this lovely blue to a brighter color um, so this is just some of the funds that we've spent um, this shows revenues so far and our projected year end and kind of where we are going to end up if we're if we keep the same tr same trajectory um, some of the the biggest issue here is is the permits which include five day permits Monday through Friday six day which is every day of the week um, a lot of students use those and the high school permits which are, which are discounted right now at $40 um, I also want to note the third party gateway here that's an income that we weren't expecting um, that comes from Park Mobile when you pay the 30 cents Park Mobile gets 25 cents of that and we get five so that's just an extra income that we weren't expecting on here um, these re revenues are as of um, July 31st so a third of the way through the fiscal year in the third party gateways we had budgeted for it in another fund, yes but yes this was an allocation issue between the traffic fund and the parking facilities yes fund. thank you yeah. um, so here are the four options that we thought of um, so right now in the marketplace garage we have a maximum daily rate of ten dollars we would like to to move that up to 14 um, and then the downtown garage the maximum daily rate is eight dollars and we'd like to move that up to 12 this would also impact the hotel rates. Right now the hotels pay us $4 per night, which is really two days of uh, parking. And um, they charge their guests between like 14 and $16 for that one night that we get $4 for. So um, if we did increase the maximum rate, that would go to $6 instead of $4. Um, in our agreements with the hotels, the, the payment is based on half of the max daily rate. So if we increase the max daily rate of parking, we get half of that per hotel stay. Mm. Yes. Um, adding Sunday enforcement. Um, so based on the, the numbers that we see Monday through Saturday, the projections that I put in here are, are what we expect to see on Sunday. And we already have the staffing, so we wouldn't need to change any part of um, the enforcement side of that um, increasing the monthly permit rates these numbers that we have right now the five-day permit is $80 and then six-day permit is 96 which does also equate to four dollars per day that they use the, um, the, the permits allotted for um, we'd like to increase those to a hundred and hundred and twenty dollars respectively um, the last one on here is the employee parking program um, so as of last month we had 900 of these parking free employee parking permits um, it takes hours 40 to 50 hours of the staff in the parking services office every single month to go through every list extend out add remove um, we've also noticed that there's a lot of people that they kind of slide in here owners of businesses that try to get this permit you know accountants who really don't qualify for what this program was intended to um, but there's not a lot of way to hold people accountable to that um, if we do a reduced fee we we would put it in their hands and they would have to pay you know by the first or second of each month and 
it would be then their responsibility to extend out or add, remove, etc. So it really gives the businesses the, you know, the, the operational worries and takes away a lot of, of the time, plus it would net a lot of money, which would be nice. Um, so going forward, we plan to talk to a lot of st key stakeholders in the community. Um, we feel like there'll, there'll be a lot of feedback, so we're, we're ready for that, but we do need to move fairly quickly, um, and we, t we plan to come back to next month's meeting to um, get some approval. Great. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start on um, that end. The parking people. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Fox, you want to start? You knew I had, would have a lot of questions. Yeah, oh, that's one right. Okay. Do. Oh, we love talking about parking. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, in all seriousness, um, I think that this makes sense, like parking operations costs are just have gone up a lot um, and so I think it's it's totally reasonable um, and uh, I do want to ask I know this is probably like a separate question from this conversation but um, is there any consideration about like the street like raising the rates on the meters as well yeah because you know we looked at all the parking data from the Main Street's Great Streets project and we know that our street parking is very well utilized, right? Whereas the garages are not quite as well utilized, and so we really want to, uh, you know, match supply and demand, right? Like, yeah, that um, sort of thing. Like raising so the, rates of those. We we would love to do that sooner rather than later as well. I think we're looking right now into um, the name is going to the UVM transportation people. Research center. Research center. There. Yeah. So they're going to be. We're engaging with them to do some some numbers and occupancy counts on the street. Cool. We don't have that data, so yes, coming soon. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Looking at uh, the specific proposals. Um, so a question on the adding Sunday enforcement. I'm just curious where do you think that additional revenue will come from, right? Is it revenue from parking ticket fines or is it better compliance? We think, so the numbers that I pulled that from are people that pay using Park Mobile or the kiosks in the garage. So we think that it's going to come from compliance, okay. not from parking tickets. Okay. Park it, parking tickets go into the general fund, so that has nothing to do with this okay. fund. Helpful, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing just so people can see each other sure. since we're done with the presentation. Um, okay, on to the monthly permit rates. Um, again, I think it's totally reasonable um, I guess out of curiosity it seems like our monthly rates are probably less expensive than some of what the private garage owners charge right so where is this in comparison to what like private garage owners are charging in the city yeah um, so I don't I didn't have data for monthly permit mm -hmm. holders um, that wasn't available on the website but I do have I mean um, like the Cornerstone Garage is max rate is twenty a day. Corporate okay. Plaza Garage is sixteen, so they are much higher. Yeah, I mean no one compares. The least expensive um, is three dollars an hour. Courthouse Plaza, so they're they're much higher than we are. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the last one on the the reduced fee for the employee parking program. Again, I think it makes sense. It's still totally like nominal. Right, I understand wanting to support, especially like our service industry workers, um, but that that kind of program is really difficult to admin. So I guess the question I had about it, is there a way to make it so they're not monthly permits, so that it's less administrative work to re-up them every single month? Ideally, what we'd like to do is give the managers of the business or whoever's doing that it would become their responsibility. So okay. we would set them up so that they can issue, take away, remove whatever based on their business. Um, yeah. We would obviously support them and, and we'd need to go to the businesses and teach them how to do this, but it should be pretty easy once we get it all set up. Okay. 
which would take away a lot of administration from our office here. Yeah, because it sounds like that is a headache, or not a headache, but it just sounds like a lot of work to have to do, yeah. right? You said 900 people, and you're, mm -hmm. so you, are you re-upping 900 permits a month? Every single month. Yeah, that's a lot, that's yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. It is, and it's a critical service. I think that I was pleased to have the commission support to, these are for restaurant and retail yeah. workers, yeah, yeah, yeah. low-wage workers downtown. Obviously, downtown is uh, fragile with uh, battling through issues of drug addiction and public safety. So, you know, we're going to connect and have honest conversations. And mm -hmm. it may be that this is not the time mm -hmm. to pull that trigger. The challenge will be how do we keep the parking facilities fund solvent uh, if we're trying to continue this program for our downtown business community. Mm -hmm. So we've got some conversations to have, but we'll work through them. Um, that's that's all the questions I have. Thanks. I think I, I support you, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of feedback from downtown stakeholders. And we'll bring it back. Yeah, yeah. it'll be what it'll be. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barr. Any comments on parking? <laughs> Thank you. I thought I got rid of parking as a when I retired, but it never is. Parking so emotional, and and I guess I wanted to point out several things that I'm sure everybody already knows, but just for the public. Um, you know, parking is a TDM measure. By raising rates, you can encourage people to use less costly ways to get around, like maybe taking the bus or finding other ways um, to get around. So I, I support the increase of, of, of the pricing. Um, and dynamic pricing, I think, is extremely important so that um, Commissioner Fox mentioned about raising the rates for on-street because there's a lot of excess supply in the garages and you can push them that way by reducing the cost or, or leveling off the cost in the garages. Uh, but I, I think it's really important. And, and su the Sunday free parking that, that's come up before. And I know that one of the things that I remember a, a, a friend of mine saying is that, you know, are, are, will people risk eternal damnation and not go to church? <laughs> By, by, because of the parking and protest, I don't think so. Um, I just think that there's going to be some some pushback on that. But uh, um, it's a struggle when you're trying to balance all the challenges that downtown is experiencing right now, with trying to attract people and then have the added, oh, there's an increase in parking. So it needs to be done, you know, as eloquently as possible and and with as much wayfinding as possible to make it as easy as possible. I can tell you Park Mobile is, is and, and I know that it, it's costly and a lot of people may not want to use it, but there's so many tools within it that you can use. And before I retired, we were using it up on campus okay. uh, quite a bit. And it, it helped us with a lot, of, especially monthly permits. <laughs> Trying to get away from monthly permits is, is something that I really encourage you to do. So that's it for me, unless there's questions. Wow. Thank you. Commissioner Yeah, I also really like parking. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of just want to second what everyone else said. Um, yeah, in terms of like demand management, presumably a good chunk of the people who are parking it in the garage have other options to actually get downtown, and uh, the buses being one of them, there's just less bus service on Sundays. It's almost, um, it's a much more difficult way to get get there. So I'm definitely least in favor of implementing uh, that, well, parking fees um, that one day of the week, unless, of course, really we have these alternatives more, more fleshed out. Um, yeah. Would you say a lot of business owners or, or potentially people who are, not eligible to be getting those free parking permits are actually taking advantage of those? Is that a common occurrence, do you think? It's hard to say because we don't, we don't have the data on the plates that we run. Mm. So I don't know. I can't say the owner of... I, yeah. I won't throw anybody, but I, <laughs> I can't say that they're, they park in the downtown garage and they have a free parking permit. But we have found 
you know, going through the list, we, we ask what the position is. And I think we've recently started going through and noticing that there's a lot of people on there that, that really don't qualify. So, but we don't know, right? We don't know if they're using that. We don't know if they're car sharing. We, we don't have the data on that. I figured. <laughs> we, yeah, and there's been a little transition in the shop. Uh, when Jeff was here, we were scrubbing and denying that a couple of requests that came to me with pleadings, and we held the line pretty firm. So, you know, I'm sure it's time again to do some uh, additional scrubbing, but um, it, we make it clear it, that it, the, the ordinance language, as you approved, is restaurant, retail, or other low wage workers. And so, um, you know, technical workers or uh, owners, managers are not eligible for this benefit. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And then one other clarifying question with regards to the hotel rates. You said for any, right, so the current is four, for roughly $4 a night for the downtown garage. Yes. And any increase beyond that would be half, any half of the increase that the hotel charges will, will go to the city or what? what is like the contract languages between the hotels and uh, the it's city parking garages. It's half of the daily max of the of daily the, max. Yes. All right. Yep. So they so currently the daily max of the downtown garage is eight dollars per day. So the hotel pays four dollars. Um, so if we increased to twelve, they would have to pay six. Right. But effectively, you're getting more than a. Well, I guess not. Right. So from check-in time to well, check-out time is. They are getting two days. They're getting two full days well, then. Well, whenever they check in, okay. they get until the midnight the following day. Got it. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Cool. No further questions. Could you say when um, the timing of when these changes may be implemented? We would love to do it as soon as January 1st. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd have to look at, you know, you, you all meet uh, mid-December, mid so with the 21-day posting period, we'd have to talk with the city attorney about whether there's, I have certain authorities if I notify the commission, and so maybe we look at trying to utilize some of those authorities to start Jan 1. Um, my hope is that that would be a clean break at the start of the new year, it's after the holidays, so. Okay, thanks. At least for the initial changes, there may be some changes here like uh, Sundays that we want to wait till the on-street uh, policy changes so that we have one united message. You know, extending the mass daily rates which affect the hotels doesn't really affect the general public. They're still paying a dollar an hour in the marketplace garage until they hit the max and the max just gets increased. So I think there are certain changes here that are easier to palette and, and implement. We'll see. Yeah, that's my sense of sort of what among these different levers, there's different different populations. Yeah. Um, some of those populations are already uh, stressed in other ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah, important. I'm be, uh, interested to see what you <laughs> come back with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Damiani. Um, yeah, I, I, I also second what everybody else has said about matching supply and demand. I'm definitely a big proponent of pushing folks to the downtown garage if folks do need to use a vehicle to get downtown. Um, I'd be curious to see, or I guess a follow-up question is the the rates, the hourly rates themselves for the garages, when was that last updated? July of 24. That was the same time, okay, yeah. the same time with the max, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I would look to, again, I don't know how much, you know, it's a relatively small number in sort of the chart that you have of by changing that max. So I'm really curious at changing that, the actual hourly rate um, on there. Mm -hmm. um, I also wonder too, as it relates to the employee parking program. So basically the business owners would get access to this backend platform, is that They correct? would need backend access. They, they, we would give them a sign in and then we would issue the permits to them and they can use them as they see fit. But they would need to pay for them. So they would, you know, they would expire on the second or third day of the month if they weren't paid for. Okay. And they have the ability to go in and change license plates or expire permits. Um, we may be able to have them issue or we may have to issue them, but that's much easier than extending them. So 
we'd have to kind of work that out. Okay. But but yes, it gives them the power to, you know, if they if they lose someone and then they hire someone else, we don't need to know. Right. Right now they do. It's two emails. Please remove this car. Please add this car. They can do it themselves. Okay. And I guess I'm also I'm this this would end up definitely being I think a gray area. But you know, there's a lot of talk around the employees that aren't. Uh, eligible for this very specific program that was approved by the commission. Um, sort of the carrot and stick, you know, the business owners now are doing more, and, and a lot of the uh, media articles that talk about businesses moving out are talking about, are referencing, whether it's true or not, referencing sort of the lack of downtown, or lack of people who are already working downtown, not, um, you know, after work doing something downtown because of that cost. I'd be interested to see more later down the road of sort of what that would look like. Maybe it's not $20 a month, maybe it is more expensive, but still cheaper for other employees of these same businesses, yeah. both equity for the employees at, at the same company. That could definitely create some sort of tension, but um, again, trying to give some something to the business owners that I think they're seeking, but still helping, but also helping the revenue for parking services. Yeah. Just something to think about. That's it. That's it. Great. Um, I, I'm supportive of increasing the um, the max rate. It's more on par with what we charge at the airport anyway, right? Which is like 12 or 14. Yeah, I can't max. remember. Yeah. Um, so supportive of that. Um, and I think like looking at the big picture, for me, the, the, the funding that we're putting towards security and the car parks is really an investment in our downtown businesses it's an investment in our workers I hope um, I hope that you can frame some of this um, to um, BBA and, and the stakeholders downtown um, but I feel like um, if we're going to use that framing then let's make sure that we have like really spiffy garages and that um, that there is a presence, that we do have ambassadors, um, that there is someone who's sweeping, like not physically sweeping, but going through. I, I, at six o'clock in the evening, was startled by someone in the stairwell at the downtown garage. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, wow, if this was one of my kids, what would how would that how would this turn out differently um, so if we are going to be touting our you know, increase of um, investment in security that really uh, we're doing the best that we can um, I think um, another question I have is what are the what are our peer cities charging for um, a daily rate, an hourly rate. Um, yes. Because if we compare this to you know, the South Mur Burlington U Mall, oh, it's it, it's free. Oh, right. What do you get? Um, so looking at vibrant downtowns and what that charges for a car park, I think is is also useful. Um, with the employee permit, is that? Can that permit be, is it per vehicle, so that if I'm working Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and Chris is working Tuesday, Thursday, can we, can my, my boss just get that one permit and we share it? Yes, you can have, you can have more than one vehicle on it too. Okay. Both vehicles just can't be parked in the garage at the same time. Okay. So yes. I think, um, just making sure that there's some mechanism that um, parking public works can have to make sure that um, that that really the people who need these are able to access them. That is, if all of a sudden your employer is now in charge of doling it out, um, it can lead, as you mentioned, to, to some unequitable distribution, perhaps. Yeah. Um, something to think about um, and I guess my final comment is the the Sunday enforcement I'm not 
super keen on that. Um, I think in part because it is hard to get downtown by a bus um, on a Sunday. Um, just trying to think of what what are the what are the buses that that don't run um, so that you have more people who if that's the day they go to church or are looking to do um, their shopping and <coughs> are using gas for their vehicle you know just kind of thinking of the spectrum um, it, it's one day that's a little bit of a of a gift, but I don't know. I, I'm I'm conf I'm totally conflicted on on Sunday. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Conflicted. That's it. Thanks. Um, any com any comments from the public? <laughs> Just uh, to introduce Mark, uh, who's here. Mark is helping out in parking services uh, and is our coordinator in parking services. So thrilled to have you here to just get awareness. Uh, Mark and his team is the front face for our office here and dealing with the public on all sorts of issues like we've been discussing tonight. So thanks, Mark. Thank you. Mr. Goulding, anyone online for public comment? Chair, no, we don't have anyone with their hand raised or in the queue at this time. Great. All right. Um, well, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and close um, item number number seven. Commissioner items. All right. It's fine. No, it's all good. What? It, Director's we've, department. We've, yeah. Oh, I have. Yeah. Oh, the oh it is. Oh, it's just switched. Is? So, Director. Who switched that? Yeah. Do you want to go? Do you want to go for? Because I, no. I was looking at it. I was like, wait. Director Spencer always goes before us. Do you want to go before <laughs> and I was us? Just and keep it. So now we expect you to answer everything uh, in your report. Or, or <laughs> do we have to go re revise the? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am fine either way. Um. Why don't, we, why don't we keep it how we normally have it, which is you go first. <laughs> Great. Sounds good. Um, you, in my written director's report, uh, just to uh, highlight the fact that uh, we have fixed the sewer siphon underneath the Winooski River. It is back in operation. We are going to keep the temporary bypass pipe uh, in place in case we have a problem with the river uh, siphon. And uh, we will then plan to decommission the bypass if all goes according to plan next spring or summer. Uh, we are uh, fully prepared for the winter season. Uh, we will start uh, paving another shim coat on uh, Pine Street as part of the Champlain Parkway so that uh, the structures are not proud so that we can adequately maintain the street for the winter season. Uh, but uh, Pine Street and Lakeside will still uh, be uh, in need of some uh, additional work. Not all the curbing will be in place this winter. Our plow team will uh, be able to work with that and, um, and SDK, the, con the contractor, will be back to finish uh, the project in the spring. Uh, we are doing a survey of North Winooski Avenue users. Uh, to follow up on the uh, design changes that we implemented with the repaving project this summer. Uh, that survey is still open, so any members of the public who haven't taken it yet are welcome to go to our website uh, and take the survey. Um, we will bring the results to you all next month. And uh, Main Street, Great Streets, the update here is that we will be going to the Council and uh, Special Board of Finances coming Monday to award the contract. Uh, we are uh, working to negotiate with the apparent low bidder as the bids did come in higher than expected as we discussed last month. Uh, we will be looking uh, at a phased implementation of the Main Street project as a result. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions?
Commissioner items. Comments. Commissioner Murtaugh. Yeah, I got a quick comment. And it's actually uh, rather specific, but regarding the uh, speed bumps on so man, South Prospect, but the Waterman kind of stretch at UVM. I understand that those were installed recently, and one comment that I have received from someone was that they are a little steep, and that uh, the campus buses especially are going four to five miles per hour as they're uh, traveling down that stretch, mm. and uh, was wondering if there was any, like, kind of what, what, the de what the design intention was for implementing that, and uh, it, you know, might right. a different shape of the bump be uh, more, more ideal given the, <laughs> well, uh, the uh, speed of traffic. And uh, I'm always walking through there, so I, I definitely appreciate vehicles moving a little bit slower, yep. but uh, maybe that's a little too slow. That's it. <laughs> Great. I'll just more on that later. Tweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the update on the, the Champlain Parkway. I guess one clarification there uh, for the multi-use path that's adjacent to it and some of like the sidewalk connections. Um, do you anticipate closing gaps or like smoothing out those um, connections? Uh, for the shared use path that's along Lakeside and Pine Street, uh, yes. Uh, there, there will be uh, maintained uh, winter access along that corridor. The shared use path south of Lakeside will not yet be open as that road is not open to traffic and the curb ramps and all the kind of uh, accessible features, including the signals at those intersections, will not be in until spring. It is a tempting and attractive surface for non-motorized traffic in the meantime. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the missing gaps <laughs> on the edges of it. Yes, we have discussed that, and um, yes, I think the challenge ultimately is without the proper traffic control in place, uh, we are uh, not comfortable with opening it to the public use uh, and encouraging use, uh, given the fact that those intersections don't have traffic control in place. Yeah. Okay. I was picturing. Um, in between uh, like the Sears Lane to Home Ave stretch and things that wouldn't be traffic controlled anyways. Sears Lane is going to have signals at that intersection mm -hmm. and Home Ave will have signals at that intersection. I know uh, when it's ready to go. Yeah. So uh, it was a discussion that uh, we did have internally. Uh, we will not be plowing that section. It will be open to the public mm -hmm. in early spring. We. Uh, are going to try to push the contractor to start before the April 15th normal start date. Okay. And what about um, Flynn and the driveway to uh, the Queen City Brewery in there? That's a little steep. I managed to flat out um, on that one. It's like a better up the lip where the <coughs> surface isn't, isn't quite there yet. Right. Is um, I imagine that's because we're saving room for a final coat. Yes. In the spring, I don't. Think uh, there's some rough edges. Yes. Okay, so that's good to know. I mean, if I will double check, uh, if we are not putting in a, a top coat or uh, the next coat of pavement, we can look at putting in a transitional uh, ramp mm -hmm. if there's a if there's a, a grade challenge there. Yeah. So you're saying uh, on Flint Avenue by past, Burlington Beer Company? Past the train tracks to, yeah. to turn in there. Okay, great. There may be other, others around, like yeah. getting in and out of the electric department in, in places. But but say pay attention to the you details. You go to BB Co. and say well, well, <laughs> Yeah. We are working it, yes, out, this yeah. week <laughs> on Pine Street, and so ramps along Pine Street and another coat are going down. So Pine Street should be improved. I'll check on Flint Ave. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, any update on staffing? Staffing. Um, so you have 13 open positions posted. Yes. None uh, of which are planning positions. Uh, so s staffing, well, the, the planning positions 
if they're not posted, it's because um, the they're posted for a set period and then they have to be reposted. Mm. So we have not hired yet for planners. So uh, that's good feedback that the 30-day window must have just clicked <laughs> and that we have to go follow up with HR and get it reposted. Um, so planning, transportation planning is still uh, uh, a work in progress. We don't have either of the two positions filled. Uh, our shortest uh, team is still in water distribution where we have two of 10 positions filled. Uh, we do have two people who have been hired who haven't started yet, which is great, and two potential people we're negotiating with. So we could be up to six uh, by next month. Uh, that is still our area of greatest burn. Uh, otherwise, in the organization, we're generally well-staffed. Um, street maintenance, which leads the winter maintenance on our streets and sidewalks, is well-staffed for this year. Okay, okay. Thanks for the update. Yeah. Nothing further here. All right, the side of the table, Commissioner Blocks. I don't think I have anything tonight. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. You're full up. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Barr. Thanks. Um, I I always give kudos, and, and I have to do it again for, for all the construction that's going around, around in the city, and it's still not terrible to get around, um, try to get around it, but it's it. I know that the construction season is short for us, and uh, there's a lot that you're doing, and I, I just want to say I appreciate it, and my neighborhood appreciates it. And uh, another um, plug for um, your team that's been working with the old East End uh, just we get answers so quickly we we're, things are working out um, we, we really appreciate yeah. the the connection and, and the partnership that we have with public work so great it's helpful to have this organized group and uh, mm -hmm. you've helped improve the uh, they are very pedestrian nice. safety down in uh, the old East End mm -hmm. so thank you no commissioner comments for me? Well, I almost didn't have any <laughs> before I left. No, because I, because, no, I came home on my bike, of course. Um, the speed cushions. Mm. So for another time, I'll unpack the term cushion because I think of a cushion as something different. Um, you can have cocktails at my friend's house and watch people just like blow over them and <laughs> um, I think just from, we walk our dog there every single night, it's kind of hysterical to see who's gonna bottom out. Um, and then kind of just like, whoa, people are going way too fast. So mm -hmm. realizing that they do play a role, um, but I do think that they seem really steep. So um, mm -hmm. I, I, in our car, when I drive over it, you really, really have got to slow down to like, three miles an hour if maybe maybe a little bit more yeah um but but it's it's it is a significant slow and then it's a speed up and then it's a slow um so i don't so i just don't know mm -hmm. if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing right um i also noticed which this makes me nervous as a cyclist the and i'm sure there are reasons for drainage and so forth but as you get close to the curb line there it like the hump the cushion doesn't go all the way to the edge. No. So I see cars scooching over mm -hmm. so that one tire doesn't hit it mm -hmm. like that. So I don't know if you pay attention next time you'll see, you'll see what I mean. So just like if you're a cyclist and you're riding on the side of the road, then you have these vehicles who are coming up to the cushion and just really scooching into already kind of cramped space. So, okay. and then the signage, now that the leaves are off the trees, well, I still think the signage is a little off because you have those, um, the stripes that kind of get mm -hmm. you to, to identify that something is coming up, but the sign's almost right on top of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was hard to see it, um, even what the sign said until you were right on, on top, top of, of the it. speed cushion. Yeah. So Thank that, you. that's my comment on the speed cushion. Um, and then um, speed cushion. the <laughs> speed cushion. 
versus speed hump or speed bump. Um, last week, um, someone spoke about Tower Terrace, um, and I and I just going to want to keep laying this out there about other streets that are hemmed in by resident only parking when and I don't know how if we could do an ordinance change or, or anything like that but just as the city continues to do work in the public right of way um, where there's some residents who then can't access their driveway and have no place else to park um, it's it's really challenging so yeah. just figuring out what the city can do either in those temporary situations or um, you know just figuring out right. these kind of islands of no resident parking and resident yeah yes RPP is the bane of my existence <laughs> and uh, yes we are uh, I did follow up belatedly um, with the gentleman from last month uh, seeing if uh, some time limited parking on Willard would uh, assist depending on what their use was whether short-term parking would be sufficient to create the turnover for them then the, to have to live with the short-term turnover parking um, so we'll follow up with them I think your point uh, Chair O'Neill Vivanco about the uh, work being done in RPP areas and not having a place to go is one that um, that yes uh, needs to be addressed and we need to give more flexibility at times of construction to be able to park in adjacent RPP areas. Thank you. That's all I have. Residential zones is probably the I, answer. Yeah. Just to find my magic wand. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so let's close out item eight, which came after um, item nine. Um, next, next item, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All right, great. Any discussion? Nope. All in favor? Thanks. Aye. 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 All right. Meeting is adjourned at 8.43 p.m.